All right. So before we get too sidetracked, onwards with the lasering. For anybody that's not aware, um, about three weeks ago, the Omaha Maker Group acquired a laser cutter. Um, it's a uh, made in China model that we ordered off eBay. Uh, it was funded by members of the group here, um, a lot of whom are here tonight. It uh, is 40 watts on a carbon dioxide laser. Um, that means that it's capable of cutting most common not metal materials, uh, acrylic, wood, pla you know, various plastics. One thing that is really important, I'm going to mention this up front and probably again, it is not intended for cutting PVC, like Sintra. You will ruin the laser cutter if you cut Sintra, and you will have a whole room full of very angry people. Um, the, if you cut a PVC with it, uh, the PVC off gas is chlorine gas, and it damages the coatings on the optics and the lenses, and uh, it makes it not work anymore. Uh, there he is. Or there will be. We have lots of big warning signs that need made. Um, not least of which is do not look into a laser with remaining eye. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna do this presentation in two parts, which is news to Eric because I haven't told him this yet. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the laser itself and uh, the capabilities and the mechanical operations, and Eric's gonna talk a little bit about how to draw for it and how to actually do the cutting, because that's kind of where we where we know about this. Um, like I say, this laser came off of eBay, uh, about the $800 price point. Um, it is a little bit ghetto in a lot of ways. It uh, takes a funny USB cable, uh, which we are going to be replacing. Um, it takes a hardware key for the cutting software. It doesn't have any, um, any fancy interfaces to print drivers or anything. You use their proprietary software to cut. Uh, they do have some drivers to cut with Corel Draw, but we're not going to talk about that tonight because it's kind of complicated and doesn't work very well or hasn't worked well for us. Um, the laser cutter itself has uh, an enclosed box here. Everybody see the TV okay? Okay. Laser cutter has an enclosed box that serves two purposes. One, it keeps the laser out of your eyes, and two, it keeps the smoke out of the room. Laser cutting generates lots of fumes which if you ever come into the, uh, the foyer out here and wonder why it smells like death, it's probably the laser cutter. Um, start a piece of acrylic on fire and see how long that, how that takes you. Uh, I'd like to, sorry to interrupt, but... You are welcome to interrupt, sir. Now, if you are cutting something currently, the setup as you're sitting here tonight, the laser exhaust runs through that wall out into that front bay. If you are cutting something which you find to create considerable fumes, or you're cutting a lot and you end up with a lot of fumes, there is a booster extension to take the exhaust out under the garage door. Uh, uh, if you can't figure out how to use it on your own, talk to me. <laughs> but that that will... said, should you be using the laser cutter? <laughs> that, is, uh, that is something that we would hope to improve at some point in the future. And when I say at some point in the future, I mean when we don't have a three foot thick concrete wall to punch through to get really outside. One thing that separates our cheap laser cutter from a fancy commercial, like a fancy laser cutter, is the way they control power. This is the control panel. If you can't read the screen, it's not because it's blurry, it's because it's in Chinese. The, uh, there's a few controls here on the panel. This is the main power button here. This has to be on um, to even start the cutting software, I think, or to initialize the laser in the cutting software. This switch um, is a real power switch. It really powers the laser off. Uh, it controls the exhaust fan, the coolant pump, which pumps liquid through this bucket down below, uh, up through the laser tube and back. There's an aquarium pump in the bucket. Um, if at any point it stops pumping, that's probably bad. The, I guess the other component here on the board is a couple of, uh, couple of switches here. The one on the left, and this is all going to get relabeled as soon as, uh, as soon as we get around to printing a new label for it. The button on the left is an enable switch. When it's pressed in, that means the laser could fire. Um, we have a switch in series with that here that requires now that the lid be shut to fire the laser. From the factory, this did not have a lid interlock. <laughs> that says something about what $800 buys you. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, and they're, they're pretty bright. They, they work really well, as everybody staring at them can probably tell. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's a second switch here. This is the laser fire switch. There's not a whole lot of useful reasons to use that switch. 
if the lid is closed and the interlock is, uh, is engaged, that switch actually fires the laser for as long as you hold it. Um, if you want to cut in a specific place on your material, you need to zero the machine to some known location. You can set the offsets of where it is in the software and then you can push that button to see where is zero. So that way you can locate your cutting on your part. Most of the time, you don't need to do that. But if you do, that's the button to do it. There you go. Two other controls on the front panel. This is a power meter. I don't really know why you would ever want to know how much power the laser is using. Um, the laser itself doesn't, 40 watts at 20% efficiency, it doesn't draw that much power even when firing continuously. Um, the, uh, the knob next to it is actually what manages the power. Um, if you turn it down too far, the laser won't fire. It does, all the way down is not the lowest power firing. You have to be about 20% of the way up the dial to even get the tube to fire. Um, we had made a whole series of marks on the dial um, for various things, like this is where it cuts plywood well, this is where it cuts acrylic well. Uh, somebody took it upon themselves to mark them with various symbols and characters um, that have nothing to do with anything. Um, at some point, we're going to put a 1 to 11 scale on there so we can say, for plexiglass, use this. What, what does it read right now? Um, it reads... Uh, Lambda, O, A, Pi, and 11. So, yes. In order ascending. The, uh, the gist of it is that you dial in the power. Cutting takes more power. Thicker materials take more power. Engraving, uh, cutting things like wood take less power. Um, you might catch things on fire. Cutting paper takes very little power, notably. Um, while we're on the topic of cutting paper, should you be cutting paper and it burst into flames? That's bad. You should open the lid and blow it out. That said, you should not close the lid again because the draft fan will fan the embers and start the paper on fire again. I know this from experience. The fact is, if you need to cut paper, the Cricut here does a whole lot better job than the laser. The <laughs> so laser just starts on fire. Yeah, that, that's absolutely yeah. true. The only, reason we, the only reason we were actually cutting paper is we had an acrylic of something and we wanted a paper backer for it. Right. So the program was already loaded um, and we didn't turn the power down quite far enough. So once you're in the, uh, in the bay here, the laser runs this gantry back and forth. It runs in, what would that be, the Y and the X. There is no Z. Um, the depth of field for the laser is probably about this deep and that's total space under the head. We have found in testing that it doesn't really cut any differently if you're cutting something really thick or something not very thick at all. So that means that the beam is, is pretty linear. As Dave points out, in melt materials that will melt, the laser doesn't have a completely square kerf. It tends to cut kind of a V um, just from heating. Yes? Uh, well, no, um, not just from heating. Uh, the the focus is enough that if you're looking for precise dimensions, um, the shape of the beam really does affect it. Uh, but for most things, it'll never use. There you go. There is a work clamp inside the bay here. It, uh, it does this and will hold things in the work, or in the, uh, in the bay, rather. If you're using that, there's nothing underneath it to, uh, to rest your material on. It's pretty important that your work be held flat relative to the movement of the, uh, the laser head. Otherwise, you'll end up with deeper cuts or angled cuts in your work if your work is off center um, or out of level. A lot of times it's just easier, a lot of times it's just easier to tape it down to the thick material. Yeah. <clears throat> thick material like this piece of acrylic Eric is working on um, that isn't going to warp on him, you can just toss it on top of the deck and it works just fine. For a, for a longer duration job, that is not ideal because the vibrations from the stepper motors will actually move the piece. There you go. Taping it down is ideal if you're not doing a very short job. If you're cutting a couple of stars out or something, just drop it in there, it's not going to move. One other thing to consider, um, the laser in this model travels free air. Uh, Colm was asking about it earlier. The laser comes out this hole at the back bounces off this lens here and down through the prism into the work. There's no fiber optic, there's no nothing. There is as much laser here. Can you that again? Stand closer to Eric. We just can't see 
see. Sorry. Oh, oh, I got you. I'm in front of the TV. The laser is generated back here behind, in the tube behind the machine. It doesn't move at all. The laser beam comes out of a hole that's right here, bounces off this lens, and then down through this prism into the work. There is a laser beam across here when the machine is in operation. So if you have a part that sticks up somehow, don't. <laughs> It'll, it'll, the beam will go right through that part because there's no like fiber optic tube to impede it or anything. Right. Does anybody have any questions about the guts of the machine or the mechanics? Okay. What's, what's the most expensive part, replacement part? So the, consuma so the consumable in the laser is the laser tube. Um, we get, according to the internet, you get between 1,000 and 1,500 hours out of the tube. They're around 150 bucks shipped. So the gig is, and, and this is kind of what we're going with right now, we don't have all the paperwork generated, but the idea is that it's a buck a job. Um, we understand that people don't carry singles. I mean, I don't carry singles anyway. So what we're, we kind of have proposed is just leaving a sign-up sheet adjacent to the laser. If you use the laser, write your name down. At the, when it's time to order a tube or when we get to some quantity of money, We'll send PayPal requests and get, uh, get some bucks for a laser tube. And that would be more than adequate to fund the cost of a tube in terms of actual dollars per hour. Um, the idea isn't to make a ton of money. The idea is maybe eventually to upgrade laser cutters if we, we raise enough funds that way. But we, we ran the numbers. It's what? If we ran the laser 10 hours a week for, yeah, 10 hours a week, five hours a day that we're here, two days a week, we'd get like nine months out of a laser tube. Um, and that's continuous. That's uh, continuous. Uh, full right. Yeah. So bottom line is put your name on the sheet. Somebody will come asking you for a few bucks, and we'll be able to buy laser tubes. It's not a big deal. Beyond that, this laser cutter um, easily takes an 8.5 by 11 part. Um, and with a little bit of creative rigging in the software can probably go to, what did we figure, 12 by 14 or something yeah. like that, depending on what your dimension is. Note that that is a workable area, not necessarily a total area. So if you were to cut, say, a 15-inch square out of your plastic, you might be able to get a bigger square in the machine than the head can actually get to. Um, ben and I were doing some cutting, cutting a panel uh, for the laser, or for the uh, capacitor discharge bank, where we were cutting out and around. We had stock that was this size, but we were just cutting a little square out of the middle. That's an example of where your workable area doesn't need to be the same size as your part. Um, if you're doing something where you expect the outer part, you know, where you're cutting a hole in something that you're gonna keep the whole piece, that's a little bit more complicated. The advantage of doing this, where you're actually cutting the edges onto it, is that the uh, edges themselves are defined by the laser too. So you, the position of your part isn't super important in the machine. Zero What's that? No, right. the, like, you know, the orientation doesn't matter. Right. As long as you're in the machine, the outside will be square to all of the holes because you're cutting all of it. Uh, this was an example where we painted the uh, acrylic, we did our cutting, and then we etched words into it uh, to be labels. You can see this part on the discharge bank in the other room after, uh, after Eric gets done here. Larry. Eight and a half by eleven. Eight and a half by eleven, and space under the head. Did the head, the head hits the part or the room under? Will it ruin the head? Probably not. Uh, space under the carriage is three quarters of an inch. Although the cut bed below the clamping area is actually quite deep, depending on what the focus looks like, which we haven't, we've not tried cutting something yet. At the, at the very bottom of that. Well, the beam is about a quarter of an inch across. Okay. Not gonna... I, I did notice that it was still enough to set paper back on fire, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> it's yeah. definitely got enough power to melt things, but you're not going to get any interesting cuts out of that. So, yeah, your, your useful height under the carriage, assuming you're setting on top of the bed, is about three quarters of an inch. That, like he said, though, you could put something longer down below and then clamp it so it sticks up less than three quarters of an inch. And you could certainly etch the tops of things that are much thicker. I mean, if you don't want to color all the way through, you can engrave on the top of, you know, thicker stuff. Right. You, you can engrave the end of a two by four. Realistic yes. cut depth is about half an inch. I mean, we, Dave and I were playing with cutting some half inch acrylic, and we just barely cut through half and three passes and before we melt the issues. 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. 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 Larry. Do you, you know yet if, it, if it, it's capable of cutting three sixteenths or quarter inch uh, corrugated cardboard box material? I am sure. The, the, the second thing is, as well, it's uh, for printed circuit boards, instead of drilling holes, we'll burn the um, If you burn the clad off somehow, it won't cut the clad. What Brandon and I were experiencing, I don't know how far he got with it, was strengthening a board for addition. Actually, I don't know what the term for that is. Masking. Um, uh, masking, and then burning it off, and just wiping the, the, the charge stuff off, and then using that to, to, for etching. But I think we got the actual etching part. So. As, as far as <coughs> causing damage to metal, you are limited to anodized aluminum. You can etch very nicely. There's a sample on the table over there that bleaches the anodizing. <coughs> You cannot make any noticeable dent or disturbance to any kind of metal whatsoever. Yeah, the, we actually, so we etched the logo, we bleached the logo on the front, on the anodized side. On the back side, we ran the logo three times at full power, and there's virtually no, no, no evidence that we did anything to it. So, yeah. Other questions from anybody? All right, Eric is going to talk a little bit about how you generate files and how you actually do the cutting. Okay, so uh, we're going to start by cutting something. Um, yeah, so we're going to start first by um, cutting something. And the, um, the software that we're using is called laser draw it's this icon here that has some funny character on it i'm not really sure what it is um, so this comes up as the default basically the workflow is you come up here and you say new layout file new layout and it asks for the size everything's in millimeters because it is china um, it will add it, so it's got you've got a drawing workspace which is the size of your part, and a laser workspace which basically just you know allows for a margin. Um, since the part the piece of acrylic that we've got in there right now is pretty big, I'm just going to stick with the default 40 by 40. Um, it'll ask you if you want to have a base a main shape, and then auto draw the main shape. What we've been doing is unchecking that box, so the main shape here really doesn't matter. But you click OK. Now, if you, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to start by using the drawing tools that are in here. You've got all kinds of things up here, like lines, circles, triangles, so forth. I'm going to draw some stars. And uh, there's nothing real magical to this. It just happened to be the shapes that are pre-installed in there. Um, the way it works is whatever's in black is going to get cut away. So you draw what you need to do, or you can, imp I think you can, Kevin, you can import something into this from like in Inkscape, right? For cut okay. Um, once you've got your image that you want to do here, or what you want to cut out, you can either use these little buttons that are across the top screen here, or you can go to the engrave menu, which is also here. Um, you're going to go to the engrave menu and you're going to hit engrave. Now you can, you can hear that it's resetting to the home position. Close that, laser's on. Um, there are several different things that you can do in this menu. Um, you can rotate your image 90 degrees, minus 90 degrees, or 180 degrees. You can also mirror it. Um, these could have... The mirroring and the rotating are probably going to be more significant when you're engraving things than when you're cutting things out. Um, mainly, you might want to mirror something if you're going to engrave it from the backside of a piece of acrylic, for example. Um, but what we're doing here, we're going to say do nothing. We're not going to mirror it. Um, the other thing to be, that we'll be most concerned about is this drop down here, whether we're engraving or cutting. 
In this demonstration, we're going to cut. Um, we haven't figured out what this nearest checkbox is, so we've just been leaving it blank. Um, really, the only other significant thing that needs to be changed, Dave mentioned you may want to change your zero point, which you would do here. Um, these are the defaults for the home position that, that's factory loaded. Um, but really, you, you might change your cutting speed, which is up here. Right now, we're set for 15 millimeters per second. Um, at some point, we will have documentation that says if you're cutting acrylic of this thickness, you want the dial on the, the control panel at, that, at one setting, and you want your speed at another setting. If you're engraving, here's the different settings. So at some point, we're going to have a nice little table based on our experiences of what the dial and the cutting speed should be set to. But for now, we're going to leave it there. So you get where you want. Rotate. You can either do nothing or you've got your different options here. Is that helping? Yes. Okay. Um, and then again, as I said, we are either going to select engraving or cutting. In this, in this example, we're going to do cutting. Um, here's the home position here, reference X and Y. These are the default settings and the cutting speed, which is up here. Um, so we're going to figure out where to change to our input. Okay, so I am switching back over to the laser, um, which isn't the greatest of images, but we are going to come over here and we're going to hit starting. And it's going to cut, you can't see it great there, but it's gonna cut a couple of stars out. Um, and one of the things we found with this uh, earlier today was that this one pass at this power was well, not quite enough. So, Without touching anything inside the lid, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to run it exactly the same, again, the same image, same program, same settings. But basically what it's doing is it's going back over and it's cutting the same image twice. The software you just showed us, the laser draw, did that come with the machine? It did, yes. So, if all went well, I can pull this out, and there's my star. So, um, and the little one. So, I'll pass that around. You can see some of the other stuff we had been playing with. Now, um, so that's cutting. The um, other things that we've been doing are the engraving which is like that, um, either in acrylic or in wood. We'll pass that around as well. I'm actually going to read, I'm act, I'm gonna redo the, our, our, lab, our logo on this piece. Um, I've already measured this. This is about 130 millimeters square. So I'm going to put this in um, close to our home position there. Actually, I think... Okay, so basically I've just put that piece of acrylic in. I, I know that it's approximately 130 millimeters. So let's uh, switch back here. Now what we're going to do is, first thing we're going to do is move that over here. Um, we're going to start a new layout. It's going to ask me if I want to save that, which I don't really care about. Um, the new one, so my workspace is 130 millimeters. 130 millimeters. I do not want to auto create the main shape, so I'm going to uncheck that. Click OK. I have a new space in here. Now I already have our logo on a, uh, an image, so I'm going to come up here to the graph menu and I'm going to come down to bitmap. Um, bitmap actually can be, as you will see here, 
any one of these files, bitmap, PNG, GIF, JPEG, TIFF, pretty much any kind of standard graphic file can be used here. Uh, like I said, paintbrush, TIFF, GIF, PNG, bitmap. Um, in this case, it happens to be this OMG light bulb new laser. Um, you come in here and draw a square, and there's our, lo our logo. Um, I'm going to reposition it to the center of the image there. And I'm going to move over and grab that little green square and enlarge it to pretty much fill that, that space. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that where our letters are filled are actually filled with patterns. Um, because this is basically rasterizing the image, um, it doesn't really see shades of gray. It, all that does, it, it, you know, it'd be nice if we could somehow say, you know, light gray is one depth, dark gray is another depth, but it, we don't have that luxury. So basically, it's going to cut everything black. And if these were color, if there were colors in there, it would basically make them all black, and you wouldn't see the distinction between the letters. So what I did is went back into our logo and filled it with patterns of different kinds of texture, uh, and that creates the distinction in the letters. Um, so that's pretty much ready to go at this point. Now we're going to go up here to the engrave menu, select engrave again. Um, this time, though, instead of cutting, we are going to pick engraving. And our speed, I don't remember. Is it one? I think it was 100, but really low power. That's one thing. On this, to get the texture like the acrylic that's floating around with our logo, it's nominal power. Um, if zero on the dial is the absolute bare minimum or you don't get the laser on, this is half an indicator above zero. So, um, so I've set that there. I've got it at 100. Um, I don't need to change my home position. I don't need to change anything else. I can hit starting. It's, it's taking a long time, and it's actually not the same effect as that. So I think that's a long time. But uh, we're, we're getting more melting than we are actual just grazing. I mean, it's worth cutting over 30 minutes a second. It's kind of that damage to the quality. No, so I think it's just quality. Okay, so. I can see some of those dark lines underneath. That's on the wood that was underneath there. Oh, okay. I just grabbed some because I wanted the plastic. Problems with the buffer overload. Uh, no, we want to experiment with the uh, the feed rates of power settings to see what works best. 